I'm Carrie Firestein, Chief Executive Officer of Allied Physicians Group, practicing pediatrician for over 30 years, mother of three, and as I say, for our newborn webinars and now grandmother of one. So I've seen the gamut of how COVID has affected everybody. Um, it's a year now, a year that we have all been dealing with this. Back in March of 2020, we thought we would close down for two months and then everything would get back to normal. And it's hard to even think about what normal was or what we want normal to be. Um, it's no wonder that our children um, are hurting, are, are having a difficult time. You know, we use the word crisis fatigue and stress management, but it comes down to the fact that their life has been turned upside down and they don't know how to deal with it or they need some help dealing with it. And as parents, we want to be able to help them. We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can for them, that we're not missing anything. You know, and yet our insurance companies insist on creating a divide between physical health and mental health when we all know that they're so incredibly intertwined. At Allied Physicians Group, our pediatricians have been doing more and more mental health over the past, I would say, five years. And certainly in the last year, we know that um, focus and anxiety and sleep and all of these things are showing up in our offices every single day which is why we've put together this seminar. We brought some of our experts to help you to figure out um, what are your next steps, what you can do yourself when you need to reach out for more help. So I'm gonna let our panel introduce themselves. We're gonna start with Dr. Farguson. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Wilfred Farguson. I'm a licensed psychologist and the director of child and adolescent outpatient psychiatry services at Stony Brook Medicine. Um, so I've been doing this work for 10 years and really found my home here at Stony Brook. And so I'm really glad to be able to be here and partner with other colleagues in the field that are helping serve our children and adolescents. When the pandemic first started, one of my instant worries was what about the children? Um, and was trying to figure out how this was gonna have an impact on their mental health. And then we knew after things started to get settled with people's physical health, that the next wave of this pandemic would be mental health. So I'm really glad that we're here to discuss this matter, to provide some tips and things that we can do for our children and families and hope to continue to partner in doing, giving more information like this out. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Parles. Yeah, hi, I'm Jamie Parles. I'm a 33 year practicing pediatrician um, who um, five years ago um, left my prior position and, and um, started a practice um, devoted to and restricted to um, pediatric mental and behavioral health problems, um, which has been um, um, extremely rewarding. And um, this year it's been very exhausting. Um, uh, although I, I don't think that makes me special. Um, so um, I'm, I'm here to, to share, um, you know, some of what I have um, learned this year and in years past um, to try to help, um, to help um, the audience uh, understand better um, how to, um, help your children and, and everybody and everybody's children manage. Thank you. Thank you. And now Dr. Lashley, you can introduce yourself and then you're going to go into the first presentation. Hi everyone. I'm Mark Lashley. I'm a allied physician. Um, my allied office is our in Valley Stream and in Rockaway Park. Um, um, Allied is uh, a great organization. We care uh, for our children across Long Island, the five boroughs, and even in Westchester and above. Uh, and we've developed a lot of group experience together, unfortunately, dealing with the crisis. And um, I think that we're very well situated to be giving advice. This is one of many webinars we've held, and I'm really glad you were able to attend tonight. So um, we're each taking a little bit uh, different tack on uh, how we're gonna approach things tonight. Um, I'm gonna speak for a few moments, uh, summing up the problem and the issues we're all having 
Um, you're all going to be nodding your heads when I speak because um, we're all going through it together. Um, yes, I'm a pediatrician, but I'm also a father, a husband, um, a grandfather too, Carrie. And um, yes, we're all experiencing the same thing right there along with you. Um, uh, but we might know a few more tips and tricks um, to help the parents out there and give you resources. Um, Dr. Parles will be speaking about uh, how to look for signs of trouble or signs of alarm or different things to look for in your children that they might be suffering from stress. And um, Dr. Fer uh, Ferguson at the end will be talking about um, many different uh, tips that you can do to alleviate the stress and to handle it. And then at the end, we'll be taking questions. Um, as Dr. Firestein said, you can write some questions down in the chat box and um, at the end, we should have lots of time. So uh, what is happening to us? Um, the best word that I can use is loss. Um, what haven't we lost? But loss of structure, loss of normalcy. Um, our everyday lives and rituals are disrupted. Um, as pediatricians, we're always talking about family dinner and how family dinner is important. Um, we used to worry about things that were so small and petty in my opinion, and now our problems uh, now have made everything seem so uh, small that we used to complain about in the past. Um, it's well known in pediatrics that family dinner is an important way to increase mental health and even SAT scores were once linked to family dinners. Well, now so many people aren't having that because our lives have lost structure. Um, uh, we've lost executive functioning. Many of you in the audience might have teens or even older children who sleep all day and are up at night. Uh, they might be doing remote school uh, and maybe not have to physically be there at their classes and they're having trouble regulating their lives and their work. Um, that's a big problem. Uh, if somebody's not sleeping well, uh, sure, it can affect your mental health. I know if I don't get at least seven hours or six hours the night before I'm ruined for the next day, uh, imagine a teen uh, who's having um, those troubles also or, or a young child. Um, loss of routine activities like sports. Um, so many children live for their sports. Uh, some children were hoping for sports as a career. And now they can't work out with coaches and the teams are not playing and all the activities that we had our hustle and bustle lives running around from activity to activity, they're all gone. And uh, our children are grieving. And um, grieving is what comes from loss. Um, it's no different than losing a loved one. We're grieving the loss of our lives. And um, we can see our children going through this grieving process. It's uh, very hard to watch. Um, and many adults are going through the process themselves. Um, career paths are disrupted. Our social skills are rusty and non-existent. Um, now that some of us are vaccinated, we're beginning to have some get-togethers with family. I had the Passover holiday with my family just the other night. And I said to my sister-in-law, I hope my social skills aren't too rusty because I can't remember the last time I went uh, together with family and saw them in person and gave e each other, you know, uh, warmth in person. It's, it's, it's like a muscle that needs to be exercised. And if we're not exercising it, we're going to lose those skills. Um, we're shut in often and isolated. Uh, children are experiencing isolation from their friends, uh, from their loved ones, uh, from their daily lives in school. And when families are together so much in the house on top of each other, it can become like a pressure cooker. Um, I put that on the slide because it, it just seems so apt to me that sometimes when we're on top of each other, every little thing we do um, seems to be a, a, a big annoyance. Um, and uh, we're going to get into later how we can deal with that. Um, and children are experiencing confusion, um, you know, conflicting information about the pandemic and what it means for them and loss of loved ones they may have had. Um, I had a mother today in uh, a, a visit and uh, who unfortunately told me she had um, been to the cemetery eight times uh, in the past year. It was so sad. And um, who amongst us is not touched by someone we've lost or know someone that we've lost? And it's uh, very hard and difficult. We're almost numb to the loss uh, and children um, are feeling this loss and, uh, and they feel uh, their parents' anxiety. They, they understand that it's a hard time and they're stressed out. They're incredibly um, perceptive and uh, they understand when mom and dad are having a hard time. And we're gonna talk about 
um, projecting calm and, 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 and how to make our children feel more safe, but um, they, they know, uh, believe me, they know even young children. And the way we approach young children and older children has to be a little different and, and we'll get into that. Children are worried about their future. They're worried about um, when the next time they're gonna see their friends are, if they're gonna have class. And sometimes uh, it's very confusing because they start having in-person class and then it's canceled and they're back on remote and then they're doing hybrid and it's such a ping pong, it's very uh, disorienting for them and confusing. And uh, one of the worst things is children of special needs. Um, we, these are the most vulnerable children and uh, all the services that they're getting, uh, remote services are not as good. Uh, they're better, better than nothing, but um, you know, having an occupational therapist over your computer is nothing like having your occupational therapist in person or your um, physical therapist or your speech therapist. Um, counseling uh, is a little different. Counseling is actually quite conducive to being over the computer and I think that has been a godsend. I'm sure uh, Will Ferguson will be talking about that, how uh, telemedicine um, has really been a very helpful tool that doctors have um, adapted with lightning speed. Uh, you know, doctors are not the fastest group to change. And uh, I, I'm very impressed with my profession and how we've adopted telemedicine and, and how it's really filled a whole, a much needed tool that we're using. And I think that mental health is one exception that counseling is adaptable to um, to telemedicine and it's very good. But uh, getting back to special needs children, uh, not getting their services, I've seen regression in a lot of my patients and lost opportunity. Uh, children with autism need special therapy and uh, a lot of them aren't getting it. Uh, early intervention, which is a very big um, a way that children at a, of a young age under three get services um, they're overloaded and the services that they're giving out are, are meted out uh, or you just can't get a hold of a therapist to come to your home and, and, and help you. And even on telemedicine, it's very hard. So um, it, it, it's, it's clear that children are suffering. It's clear that they're hurting and uh, it's clear they're experiencing loss and confusion and grieving. Um, it's important to recognize the signs uh, of uh, when your child is in trouble or, or um, going through stress. And Dr. Parle is going to talk about that. But um, everything I'm saying is really just summing up all that we're feeling. And I want to let you know that um, as doctors, uh, we're not immune to this. We, we feel it and we understand it and we're here to help. And when you see that your child is going through something or, or you're worried about it, um, then your pediatrician is the person to turn to. We have special training on uh, what to look for and advice for you. So um, that's why these webinars uh, are so important and I'm so glad you were able to attend tonight. We're going to talk to you about signs to look for and things that you can do and um, ultimately uh, directing you back to your pediatrician uh, when you think that you've uh, noticed something uh, that we're talking about. Um, we've uh, we're going to be looking at the chat box at the end, so don't worry if you write your questions down. A lot of the questions that people are writing down, I can see, are really overlapping, and um, we'll be able to uh, touch on all of them. So uh, I hope that I've uh, touched on all of the uh, head points that we're, we're experiencing, and I'm going to give it over to Dr. Pauls now to talk about really how do you know if your child is suffering or having a problem? What are the signs? Dr. Pauls? Thank you. And, and, you know, thank you everybody for attending. Um, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to uh, have a, a, a good sized group to, you know, to, to speak with. Um, so, um, you know, mental health problems are, are more common during the pan have been more common during the pandemic and existing problems um, have become more Severe or difficult to treat in in a lot of um, in, in in a lot of people, um, you know. But but parent but signs for parents and and other responsible adults um, to be aware of um, are are more or less the same as as they have been. With you know, there's a few um, pandemic specific situations that, I'll, that I'm going to talk about at the at the end. Um, you know whether. Um, a change in behavior that is, um, um, you know, that you may notice in um, in your child or someone else's child um, is an important sign or not, um, you know, depends on two basic factors in 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 um, most, if not if not all, cases. One, 
Is it causing a loss of function? Is that child or adolescent um, less able to do what they what they need to do or want to do? Are they are they doing okay at school? Are they are they uh, participating in in this in the sport that they normally do? Are they socializing? Um, are they are they you know going about their um, their business and pleasure uh, you know to the extent possible um, you know with with the you know, with the intent and with the um, um, level of enthusiasm that they did before. Um, and then the other um, um, situation that marks a change as significant is whether it's causing emotional distress in that person. Um, you know, and, and keep in mind that, that, um, that we're talking about, um, that I, what I'm talking about is whether it, it's causing emotional distress in that child or um, or adolescent, not whether it's causing emotional distress in the people around them. Um, you know, sometimes you know behavior changes that that are developmentally normal can cause um, a degree of emotional distress in parents, such as you know an adolescent um, starting to spend more private time alone in their room o- away from family members. That's not a sign. Um, of a problem, un, you know, unto itself, unless there are there are other signs. But but loss of function and or um, emotional distress are the um, are the red flags. Um, you know, problem signs to look for. The most common ones um, I'll r- just run through: change in sleep, either trouble falling asleep, which can be caused by you know problems with anxiety, depression, you know, uncontrolled ADHD, and others. Um, depression can cause excess sleep, you know, more sleep than usual, can't get out of bed after 12 hours, you know, or a dramatic change in sleep pattern. Like, like Mark talked about before, we see some kids who are um, sleeping all day and awake all night, um, which makes it difficult to function um, with, you know, with school and, and other activities um, occurring during the day. Um, and that usually means that, that there's something that needs to be, you know, attended to. Um, major changes in appetite are less common, but 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 no less important. Um, talking about difficulty eating with with unintended weight loss, or persistent overeating or binge eating with a major weight gain, you know, is what we're talking about. You know, not the kind of eating changes that many of us have many of us have had um, during the pandemic, uh, just from um, you know being tired of either cooking or takeout every night and having limited choices, limited options, and, and you know, getting uh, sick of what the options are. Um, um, change in mood is, is important, you know, uh, whether, you know, whether we're talking about a low mood with, with signs of depression, loss of motivation, loss of self-esteem, hopelessness, loss of enjoyment, or, or, or whether we're talking about, um, someone who is irritable or angry or, or withdrawn or inappropriately euphoric. Those are, or, you know, when those signs are there in a way that, that um, speaks to loss of function or emotional distress, those are, those are things to, um, you know, to ask for help about. Um, you, know, anxi- you know, anxiety is, is, is very prevalent during the pandemic. And, and I think it's important to talk about the difference between um, appropriate anxiety and inappropriate anxiety. I think, you know, being in a room full of people, you know, without masks right now um, that you don't know um, is appropriate anxiety. Um, you know, being afraid to walk to your mailbox to to get the mail um, when there's nobody around is inappropriate anxiety. So, you know, so anxiety, worry, nervousness, sense of discomfort that leads to friction with others or avoidance of you know needed wanted important activities also a sign that that there's trouble that that needs to be looked into and then you know um uh, trouble with attention focus concentration that impairs um the ability to, to to meet responsibilities that that's a sign and and keep in mind that all these things can um can be new that show up um you know, in large part due to the, the stress of the pandemic, um, uh, making them um, come out or get, you know, or get worse than they had been, or they can happen in um, 
um, children or adolescents with known mental health disorders um, for whom the stress of the pandemic um, makes their, um, their treatment um, either um, you know, less effective or, or more difficult um, to, you know, to deliver. Um, I should also mention, you know, new or changing, um, you know, substance use or misuse in, um, in an underage person, it, you know, is a sign that, that something, uh, you know, may very well be wrong. A uh, couple things, you know, that, that, um, that have come up during the pandemic uh, that, that, you know, that we wouldn't know about um, if not for the, you know, if not for um, what we've lived through over the last year is that virtual and especially hybrid learning um, are especially difficult um, for kids with, um, with ADHD and or autism who, who can't function well without structure. Um, um, my take home on that is that, is that it's important for parents to allow um, for a lower performance standard in, in those situations to help um, reduce stress and preserve self-esteem. It, it is unlikely that, um, uh, you know, for a lot of kids in that category, that they are going to be, be able to have the same grades this year that they did last year. Um, and um, I think parents' job is to take some of the heat off of them while continuing to ask for and insist upon a, um, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a legitimate effort, okay? Um, and then social anxiety is also a, a bit of a special circumstance because um, a lot of people with social anxiety, um, you know, in many ways have had an easier time um, during their um, time uh, stuck at home um, as, as social stressors, which, which would normally be, um, you know, cause um, reasons for their anxiety to, to, to increase or are not there. And, and the changes that are likely to make it easier for, for, for most, such as return to school and group activities, uh, might create increased stress and difficulty. Um, so those are, you know, are things to think about and watch for that are pandemic specific. But, but basically, you know, the, the signs that you're looking for are similar as they were before the pandemic, uh, just more likely to happen and more likely to happen with a greater degree of severity. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to Will. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so in terms of thinking about ways that parents can support their children, um, I just wanted to lay the framework that I found, or things that I've learned from the pandemic, which has been an increase in flexibility, creativity, and, sim and noticing simplicity. Um, where we can bringing things back to the original form and figuring out at the foundation what's most important to us, or some of the takeaways that I've had. And so I'm gonna kind of try to frame my structure in that lens um, for this talk. So in terms of creating structure, um, I want all of our parents to be mindful that we spent many, many years trying to pull our kids away from electronics to pull them away from video games and from social media. And in one quick decision pivoted and said, okay, now your entire world is now virtual. And so that causes us to start to think we have to be a little bit more flexible in our approaches in the way that we do things. Um, so I think creating a structure in terms of a time and a schedule is helpful but I would encourage folks to be flexible and collaborative with their children when they're getting ready to set up the plans for the day or for the week. Um, I think that, you know, letting children decide which homework assignment they want to take care of if they're doing fully remote learning, um, allowing them to ha have some agency and decision making and when they're going to wake up as long as they're meeting their requirements for the day. Um, and then with the flexibility component is also helping in knowing when to drop the rope. Um, in a tug of war that we sometimes get into with our adolescents. Uh, and I know that's maybe difficult to do, but you know, what you're gonna gain long-term in terms of keeping your kids engaged in remote learning and allowing them to continue to be flexible um, is going to be, your net gain is gonna be much larger. 
I think it's also really important to know that our kids, they take their cues from parents and that's been said earlier here today. So, um, you know, showing that you can be flexible and working with them and learning how to adjust to the day-to-day -day changes, week-to-week -week changes where you're remote one day and then you're uh, back in school the next. <clears throat> um, I also think that physical structure is really important. Um, so, for example, we know that children should, as best as possible, and when there's room in, in the household, should not be doing their homework in their bed. Their bedroom is supposed to be their sanctuary to relax. And so intense studying and remote learning in the bedroom doesn't really give, con uh, isn't really conducive. Um, and then the direct opposite as well, right? Um, kids can often fall asleep in their bed. They're expected to sit there and do homework um, and do remote learning. Then there's also like social and emotional limits and structures too. So parents, <clears throat> if you have, you know, maybe a little late in the game now, but allowing your child to have privacy in education, understanding that their relationship with their teacher, even if it's virtual, is still theirs to have. And you should be called in and, and respond when called in by the teacher, but not necessarily eavesdropping. Um, we also the same, we don't want our kids, you know, picking into or poking into our work meetings either. So we should respect those boundaries where we can. And I also think that in terms of structure, having check-ins with your children, we thought it was mentioned earlier about dinner, but finding a way for the family to connect. And I think that's one of the things when I talk about the simplicity that the pandemic has taught me is figuring out to the root, like, wow, sometimes we may only have the people that are in the four walls of this house and we should really take advantage of that. And that also creates a really nice space for the social and emotional development and the relationships. How do we know when our kids are not doing as well, but we're now talking to them on a regular basis and we're setting up these emotional check-ins, one in the morning, one in the evening, similar to as if we were dropping them off at the school bus and now we're doing it in our home just because the kid's still there. Doesn't mean that those things have to stop. <clears throat> I think the, there's great importance on um, exercise, which again has been mentioned. Um, you know, in our practice here at Stony Brook, we're hearing about kids getting six to 800 steps on their Apple Watch per day. You know, that's something I get, you know, by making breakfast and packing lunch for my kids. So that means that young people are really just in their rooms, in their beds for the majority of the day. And we know that that's not really healthy. Um, so getting up, we'll talk about going out into the nature, what that can look like as well. But getting up, getting active is still very, very important. And understanding that kids don't have their fitness centers and they don't have their buddies that they played basketball and football and baseball with. So parents, that means we may have to get up and do some of those activities to the best of our ability. Um, I know there's a lot of concern about safety and the numbers in Suffolk, you know, they're still concerning um, for COVID-19. So if we are able and fortunate enough to have other family members that we trust or little extended families where we can create little bubbles, especially as the summertime starts to come around and the weather gets warmer, um, finding places if there's like two or three families on the block that really get along well that you trust can are otherwise trying their best to be as safe as possible, allowing your children to interface with those people, of course, with masks and social distancing, but trying to figure out ways to be creative and recreate what was once um, all of the extracurriculars that were involved with school. Um, and again, that's where the pandemic forces that kind of creativity. Um, having balanced meals um, and sleep hygiene has already been discussed, but you know, keeping in mind that sleep hygiene routines, getting our kids off of electronics at least a half an hour before they try to get ready for bed is gonna be an important component to that as well. And all of these things would have great impact on the mental health. Um, so we're talking about um, experiencing nature and this for me was like the simplicity, recognizing like, wow, we can go to the beach and just be at the beach and that's, that freedom can be really liberating and, and kind of taking in having our children notice the sun, and, and we'll talk about mindfulness as well, but notice the sun, notice the sand, notice the smells of the water, um, going for walks in parks, looking at the rocks, looking at the leaves and, and taking in all that is nature. Because um, we're spending so much time you know, on our computers all day because that's most of what we're doing, that when we get a break from that, we really want to take, um, take all of that in. Uh, so, Mindfulness, I wanted to kind of explain a little bit about my, what mindfulness is and it's more recently been well known to help people in terms of stress management. Um, it's not always directly for that. Um, sometimes mindfulness is just about observing our environment and, and taking in the beauty. 
Um, the, so the dialectical behavior therapy approach, it, it notices three different categories of mindfulness. Um, one is which is, one of which is to observe, and that's just to simply silently just see what's around. And this is going to be perfect for a nature walk that you could do with your family um, to go ahead and just see what the environment has to offer you for that day. Then the second category is to describe, which is where you would mindfully look around and describe things like and not just without judgment. And that's the beauty of mindfulness. It allows us to have like the first level of thinking and just seeing things what they are, looking at the blue trees, the blue leaves on the trees and noticing how they go against the brown bark, things of that nature. And then the third category is to participate, which means to fully get invested and involved in what the activity that's taking place around us. And this may look a little different during a virtual um, capacity because we were not able to see all that's in people's environments. But where we do have the opportunity, and again, if we're doing family time to, to dance, to laugh and to play, um, it really does create an opportunity for enjoyment. I'm gonna share with um, everyone a quick mindfulness reading that should take about 60 seconds. Um, and this one is primarily for um, mindfulness, really just actually for the, um, the describing portion where you're going to go through your five senses. And so I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So the goal here is to calm your mind by using your five senses to focus on your environment instead of your thoughts. First, I'd like for you to notice five things that you can see. Look around you and become aware of your environment. Try to pick out something that you don't usually notice. Second, Notice four things you can feel. Bring attention to these things that you're currently feeling, such as the texture of, your, of the clothing on your skin or the smooth surface of the table that you're resting your hands on. Third, notice the things that you can hear. Listen for and notice things in your background that you don't normally notice. It could be the ch birds chirping in outside or an appliance humming in the next room. And fourth, notice two things you can smell. Bring attention to the scents that you usually filter out, either pleasant or unpleasant. Catch a whiff of the pine trees outside or the food cooking in the kitchen. And finally, notice one thing you can taste. Take a sip of a drink, chew gum, or notice the current taste in your mouth. So an activity like that would even be really fun with a young person a young child to do, and even for a teenager. I often encourage people, or I was encouraging people, those that were working remote and or learning remote to do a mindfulness activity before they started their work day or their school day and after. Because even if you were in a similar setting, you wanna kind of get oriented to your environment, get oriented to, okay, my books are here, my work screen is up, my emails are going, kind of getting into that oriented to the space. And then similarly, when you're done, okay, I'm now sitting in my living room couch, my TV is on, I'm getting myself an afternoon snack or we're getting ready to have dinner so I can smell that. Orienting yourself using the five senses is a great opportunity to kind of shift gears when you're stuck in the same house for the entire day. Um, and then, so looking ahead, um, I wanted to just kind of pinpoint that Although a lot of people have been asking, you know, some people are going back for the remainder of the school year starting next week. Um, I'm also even looking a little bit further ahead. Um, the last uh, 12 months has certainly been one of uncertainty and uncertainty and we've had to adjust. And I think again, using the flexibility, creativity and simplicity um, would be helpful. But I'm also thinking about what's gonna happen in six months when we hopefully will go back to school. Most of us joining back to school in person similar to how we've done in years past. I think that I'm gonna give a heads up to parents now that as the school year, this academic year comes to a close and the summer starts to open up and let's say that things go well and the vaccines help um, fight against all variants and other infections go down. Um, we need to be thinking about what we want our transition to look like. I don't think that we can have the same transition where you know, it's, it's August 30th and a couple of days before school opens, we're gonna have our kids start to get back on their sleep cycle. We wanna make sure that the days that they have in the summer are purposeful. Um, I think that we should continue to have collaboration in terms of the structure, talking with our kids now, 
What do we want to do this summer that's going to make it a smoother transition back to school? Um, and so I think, you know, part of that is, is going to be involving hearing the kids, allowing them to have some say so that agency also helps them reduce their anxiety. So, you know, what's most helpful for them. Um, and then lastly, I would also, of course, um, like Dr. Lashley had mentioned, insert that mental health treatment. Uh, most of it is being done via telehealth and telemedicine now, which is great. Um, but at the same time, the system is, ha, does have some strains. So I would encourage folks to reach out to their pediatricians first. Um, those, those pediatricians that you've worked with know your children well. Most of the pediatricians, if not all, are screening for mental health symptoms anyway and can help you with referrals. I would also say that to know that um, the opportunities to do therapeutic groups are a great option as well for folks that are experiencing significant distress. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of those, again, are being done via telehealth, so you don't have to worry about your, your child um, joining your group with, with people that they're not familiar with in a small, confined space. Um, but it's definitely a good opportunity now as this pandemic continues. As I said in the beginning, the, um, the second wave is related to mental health, in my opinion. And so I think getting care and having discussions like this are truly, truly important. Thank you. Wow, thank I am unmuted. Thank you all for um, such great information. You know, Dr. Ferguson, so many of your tips are just simple things that, you know, we can all do and we should all do probably on a regular basis. But when you put it all together, you could see where, you know, that that can make a difference. And, you know, sometimes we get out of the habit of, of doing those things. But that brings me to one of the questions that one of the the people submitted, one of the, the parents is, you know, how do you know if what your child is experiencing, the anxiety, the sadness is related to the pandemic or is the pandemic just revealing some underlying issues that they either had or were going to have anyway? I think that's a really, um, it's a good question. I think kind of one of the tougher ones, um, especially considering that the pandemic lasted so long. I don't think that you can say that it was a quick adjustment and things, um, there's, we may not be able to fully tell if this was something that was developmentally going to happen. Um, my hunch is to say that, you know, getting support and getting treatment that there's never really a wrong time for that in the mental health capacity. Um, so I would encourage anyone that, you know, I don't know that we can say, even if it, well, this just happened because of the pandemic, I don't know that we can say it's going to go away just because when the pandemic goes away. I think some of the impacts of these things may be longer term and could, uh, could be best treated through mental health care. Thank you. Um, Dr. Parles, there were a bunch of questions about motivation, um, specifically in the you know, I would say the middle schoolers and high schoolers, you know, how do you get them to really care about online learning or doing their homework or anything, cleaning their room, you know, all the things that we always argued with our kids about before um, and now is just one more on the list. Well, <clears throat> sometimes you can't, um, sometimes it, it, you know, it, it, things just go on too long and it's too much and and you know, I think in, in you know that that um, that whole idea that Will said before about dropping the rope um, is is important to make sure that that um, that what what you're concerned about really does matter, whether it's important or not. Um, I I think that that um, one thing that helps with um, um, with motivation is structure. Um, you know, knowing what comes next, knowing what's expected, that the that the structure um, is reasonable and that it, it has some relationship to the usual time structure that kids are used to. Okay, um, and that um, and that the structure is created in a way that that works for children. Um, for some families, it's very, very difficult. If you have two parents that have to work outside of the home and kids are, are you know, working from home and taking care of each other, 
that that can be very difficult. But I think creating a structure that 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 best mimics the you know the the time frames that ki that kids are used to during the day are, are important. And also creating creating boundaries um, of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And 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 I think a good way of creating boundaries is to use um, um, positive reinforcement techniques that 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 when children and, and teenagers and really even adults when they have things that 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 they want um, that they need to earn them by meeting their responsibilities uh, which is really the you know the core of of positive reinforcement um, that uh, which is really the the opposite of punishment punishment is when you take something away because somebody did did something bad um, positive reinforcement is when they earn something by doing something that they are supposed to do. Either way, you can end up with a um, with a 12 year old with or without their phone the next day, okay? But if they earned it through good behavior, that makes it more likely that they're gonna repeat the good behavior. Whereas if they have it taken away because of unwanted behavior, um, they don't really learn as much from that. They just get, um, you know, they they they're just more likely to to become unhappy um, and and not learn the lesson from it. That was such good advice, Jamie. What a good doctor! <laughs> I'm giving you positive reinforcement. I could use it too. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I'm reading from a list. Oh. <laughs> And sometimes if you've, you're trying all these things, it may be that as a parent, you're too close to the situation and it pays to just get another point of view to see if what you're doing is right. Or if you're doing all the right things and your child still isn't responding. Um, I agree, it, it's never wrong to reach out for help um, as a parent you know, for yourself or for your child, which um, brings me to this question, Dr. Can, can I jump in on one, one thing you just yeah, said? Yeah. That 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 um, how do I say this without without sounding like I'm accusing anybody of anything? But but um, but the children do respond um, to the problems that their parents have, and and sometimes what is needed is that parents you know or parents who are struggling get help for themselves, um, and and um, and very often parents will avoid getting help for themselves because they think they have too much to do for their children. But if they are struggling um, and, and not doing well, um, they're not doing their children any favors by neglecting them, their, their own mental health needs. Yeah, that was actually one of the questions, like, am I contributing to my child's distress? And so um, that's something I, I wanna talk about. I think that um, parents, at this time really need to project calm, even if they don't feel it inside. Their kids have got to know that they've got this, that they are their rock, that um, home is a safe place, that, that they are creating um, a, a secure environment for them. Actually to, 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 little, uh, to modify that, I think that the way you speak to a teen a uh, 16, 17 year old is a lot different than we'll speak to a nine year old, right? So uh, a, a 17 year old needs to have more of an intellectual discussion, needs to understand your emotions and you can share with them and enlist them at, at their help. Um, hey, Stuart, we're having a hard time right now. We're all having a hard time. I'd like you to realize what's going on. Yes, mom and dad have this uh, you know, situation, but I, I agree and tell me what's going on with you and, and we'll work on this together. Whereas a nine-year-old, you might say, don't worry, mommy's got it, mommy, everything is fine. Every, you know, Don't worry, this will be over one day and, and mommy loves you and, and, and let the child feel secure. Young children really need that sense of security. If they feel like they're blowing in the wind, that's when they get things like signs of post-traumatic stress disorder or, or anxiety. And an older teenager doesn't want to just hear the fluff. They want to be more involved. They want to understand exactly what's going on and be more of a part of the solution and, and be treated sort of like an adult, even though they're not. Yes, 
So one of the moms um, just put up in the chat, um, and Dr. Farkasen, maybe you could answer this. Um, you know, regarding this current conversation, wouldn't you say it's okay for kids to see the real side of things too? Isn't it okay to cry? And how much can we hide with them around all day long? Um, you know, and, and Dr. Lashley, you talked about different ages requiring different things. In pediatrics, by the way, that's always the answer, right? Go to the developmental level of the child. But um, Dr. Farkasen, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, it is a good question. I think it is very hard for to completely hide and shield. I think um, I think there's a difference between that, though, and what Dr. Lashley was speaking about also. I think our kids do need to see a range of emotions from their parents because they're modeling that. And we also want to model emotional intelligence for our kids. At the same time, let's be sure to show our children that there still is an authority in the house and that the, the house is still safe and secure. Um, and at the same time also, let's continue to have fun with our children. You know, so if, yes, if this is overwhelming, the loss of life, of actually physical life or the loss of the structure and the things, the activities that we're used to in, in terms of having fun is also upsetting to us, communicating with our kids about that. Of course, they can see you cry, but then also let them know mommies and daddies cry and here's why. Um, and this is what I do to move past my cry so that they can see that process as well. So mommy's gonna take a few deep breaths. I'm gonna take a break, um, you know, whatever that looks like for you so that your child understands that there's an emotional process that it's okay to have negative feelings. This is how we move through them. This is what, and then again, if there's an older child, this is what you can do to help me move through them. Um, and we are in this together. Um, but then, like I said, and then once you're through that moment, making sure that your child gets to see you having fun and having fun with your child. That will also help them with the motivation. Let's all go out for a run together. You know, let's all see what we can do. Let's all throw the football around and, and make some fun out of this event. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that came up a few times had to do with homeschooling, remote learning um, versus in school. So Dr. Lashley, as a pediatrician and you're seeing um, you know, the illness and the COVID in, in the community, with most of the schools now offering full in time as an option, um, what do you think about that? Should we be encouraging our children to do that? Are you comfortable with that happening? Well, a study after study from the CDC have shown that schools are not major spreaders of COVID. Um, there are safety measures in place in schools. They're not perfect. And um, yes, there is a risk, but we don't think it's a very large risk um, of sending your child to school, even after there have been um, you know, uh, some uh, surges. Uh, hospitalizations are down on, in general and uh, ha uh, sick people are down and deaths are down. And children, um, you know, actually do remarkably well uh, during COVID. Uh, I have only put one patient in the past year uh, in the hospital um, and that patient had underlying conditions. So uh, almost more than 50% of infections are asymptomatic. And uh, most of the children don't even know they have or, or have a very mild cold. And now parents are more and more getting vaccinated. So the parents are, are feeling safer and children need to be in school. I mean, we've, we've talked about how they're suffering and any way that we can get back to some semblance of normalcy is a good thing. I think we need to reinforce how to stay safe when you leave the house about wearing your mask and not taking it off and peer pressure maybe to remove it. Uh, and when you eat to sit six feet away from someone else. Um, and I, I think that we need to reinforce uh, just like we teach our kids street smarts and how not to run in the street. We need to teach them how to avoid getting sick. Uh, but I think that um, the school is not a dangerous place and our kids are suffering from not being in school. Having said that, you know, it's interesting. I have kids that are thriving on remote learning and that I never thought would. And I have uh, patients who um, are just not coping at, at all. Um, some kids with ADHD, for example, do great on remote learning because they're not in the classroom and they don't have all the 20 kids in the class running around trying to talk to them. And they're a lot less, more focused at home. And some ADHD kids um, are distracted by things in their room or they don't have somebody to redirect them. And it's really all over the dartboard. 
But the answer is you have to know your child. You have to know what your child uh, thrives in, uh, what they need, and, and you know, see how they're doing uh, and then make your decision as a parent. But by and large, I think school is a good place for kids to be, especially now as more and more adults and Americans are getting vaccinated. Yeah, I would agree with that as a pediatrician. You know, at the beginning, we worried about the kids bringing stuff home to grandma, but now grandma should be vaccinated. So I think it's it's a safe, the schools are, are relatively safe and there's in the risk benefit ratio, there is so much benefit to kids getting back to, to school and some sense of normalcy. Um, so Dr. Carls, what about the college kids? We're not really, you know, either they're living with us or they're away, you know, you wanna help, but they're adults, you know, what are your suggestions to, you know, to deal with your college kid? Well, I, I think it goes back to those original two criteria of loss of function and emotional distress. And if they have loss of function or emotional distress, they need help, okay? Um, and sometimes that means they need to leave college because they can't manage at this point. And that happens sometimes. And that, that's, uh, there are some kids who, you know, with mental health problems who go away to college who aren't really ready to take care of themselves. And there are people, you know, kids who, you know, development, you know, previously unrecognized or, or um, you know, or, or um, uh, you know, or new mental health problems while they're at college that unfortunately have to leave, come home and get, and get treatment. Okay. But in general, my approach to college kids is leave them alone. They're in college. Okay. Um, it is, um, you know, I, I, I know that the, the um, degree of connection for a lot of college kids and their parents is much greater than it was in the pre-cell phone, pre-texting era. Um, but um, I think that, that college is a time of learning and growth and individuation and, and, and figuring out, you know, what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, and so if your college kid is doing okay and not having major problems, um, um, uh, you know, be kind to them and, and, and let them find their way. Thank you. Um, Dr. Farkason, one of the parents um, asked in the chat earlier on, if you're concerned about your child, um, are there screening tests that a parent can do at home? Like, what do you think about a parent doing a PHQ-9 or, or Googling depression at home um, and, and going by that? That's a good question. Um, I, I would probably recommend still being within um, within in or around one of your pro providers or your pediatrician or mental health provider, because what happens then if you do a PEHQ nine at home and you recognize that there's a problem, it's now what, and you, and you may not be fully ready to handle that conversation or know what to do with your child. So I think you know for folks that are really just trying to see what's going on with their child. I think getting in to see um, one of the providers, uh, mental health or again, primary care would be the, the ideal. So that if the child does screen positive for symptoms of depression or significant, significant anxiety, there's an immediate response in the moment. Um, you again, will probably be the, one of the better judges of your child's functioning. And so you'll be able to tell some of those things in advance anyway and can bring that up into the conversation. And then if we're also developmentally appropriate, allow for your child to have some time alone with the care provider so that they can open up more honestly, possibly about what they're feeling and going through. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things I would say is that at Allied, at every well visit, we give a questionnaire. It's called a teen screen that has 37 questions about how a child's feeling. Um, and sometimes parents look at this and say, you know, he's fine. Do I really need to do this? And I'm not saying necessarily during COVID, but 
it's a good thing to let your child do that because it teaches them that the pediatrician is there not just for colds and um, sinus infections and bug bites, but also for all of them, for their mental health, for how they're feeling. So we try and lay that groundwork early on. And if you have a doctor that you can trust, it's certainly much easier to have that conversation first and let them administer the test than to be doing things at home that I agree maybe you're not quite prepared for. Um, so Dr. Paul, somebody asked, um, you know, they're trying to get their teens to go out and do family things and they're meeting nothing but, you know, resistant and adamant refusal. So is this one of those times to use positive reinforcement or do we just let it go? What do you think? I think it depends on the circumstance, okay? Um, I think if, you know, if you're talking about, you know, somebody who is, um, has severe social anxiety and, and, and what you're talking about is going somewhere with 37 people they don't know, this may not be the time, okay? Um, but if you're talking about a relatively well and healthy, you know, teenager who, um, who just doesn't want to, you know, get together with the rest of the family on their sibling's birthday, then I think that that's a, a, a boundary that can be set and, and that there can be, um, you know, like we talked about before, ways to incentivize, um, you know, the behavior that you want, the, that, that, that sense of, of being a, a responsible part of a group rather than a, a complete free agent. And there's room for negotiation too, you know, if you do this now, you can do that later. You know, um, I, I think you know. I think I, I think it involves judgment, um, and I think it involves flex. You know, like Will said before, flexibility. Flexibility is important. Okay, um, authoritarian approaches tend to breed resentment and revolt, um, whereas um, um, more. Um, an approach in which you join your child emotionally and understand, you know, um, at, at least try to, to demonstrate some understanding of what, why, um, you know, what they're feeling and why in that moment uh, is more likely to, to, to bear um, fruit. So a little empathy. A lot of empathy. <laughs> We can all use a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, we are at the hour mark. So I looked through, we answered 36 questions tonight um, in the chat. And I believe um, the questions, Brie, do those go out as well? Yes, we'll be able to provide those as well. Great. And Dr. Ferguson, are you, can you um, give Brie a copy of that meditation um, of the senses so that we can send that out to everybody as well? Absolutely. I'll send that that was great. Uh, you know, something as simple as that and just, you know, three minutes of breathing and, and that and um, I felt a little calmer and I rushed from work to get here and was stressed all day. So thank you for that. And there's um, so much Brie, research to show that it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Brie, was there anything that you see that we missed? Any major questions? Um, there was one question about, I see some questions about summer camp. Um, whether or not to send the kids. Um, some of the camps look like they're not wearing masks. Do you have any advice for that? Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, I don't think there's an easy answer. And uh, the March experience might be very different than the July experience. Um, I think I would be uncomfortable with that. Um, my son, my nine-year-old or 10-year-old son running around in a group of 50 children uh, might make me kind of nervous. So um, I don't think I'd like that very much. But if uh, the experience is different and, you know, infection rate is way down, um, who knows? But uh, I, I think that we each have to take each situation and understand what the camps are doing before we send them. Right. And like Dr. Farkinson said, it's hard to say, okay, you, we're going to keep you in all summer, but then September 1st, we're sending you back to school. Um, so you might need to make other arrangements for, for your kids over the summer to, to see other people, to be outside and outdoors. But the local infection rate really, really matters. Okay. And right now it's not very good. And hopefully in July, it'll be better. But, you know, hope is, uh, is not always the best plan though. 
No, it's interesting. Summer camp is such a Northeastern thing. Uh, you know, the rest of the country doesn't know from summer camp. Uh, I didn't realize that until I traveled around and people said, what, your parents sent you away for two months and they, <laughs> the whole summer? Uh, didn't they love you? And I'm like, well, that's what we did up in the North. Uh, and then day camp. So, uh, you know, it's it's not a God-given right that you have to go to summer camp. Yes, you get a nice break from the kids, which is great for us, but I think we have to think that you understand the pandemic is not over. We still need to be careful. And every day, the director of the CDC is virtually in tears right now, trying to get us to continue not to get COVID fatigue and to understand we have to stay safe. So uh, something as, I don't want to say frivolous, but luxurious as summer camp, um, maybe we're not quite ready for that if they're not going to be any kind of measures in place. So going back to school, yes, right? But that doesn't mean that we go back to everything. It's not, it's not all or nothing. Um, and then vaccine. Is there anybody on this panel that doesn't think that everybody should get a vaccine as soon as they are able? Everyone should get the vaccine. I talk about vaccine all day long. That's what pediatricians do now. Uh, everybody's asking us about the vaccine. And um, you may not know this, but April 6th, New York State is dropping the age down to 16. Uh, and the Pfizer vaccine uh, is licensed down to 16 and uh, the Moderna is to 18. They've enrolled uh, over 20,000 children in trials down to age 12. We expect that results, uh, those results to be ready in July. Um, and then infants, they've started uh, actually immunizing infants and we're gonna have that data uh, probably in January. So um, there are 2000 people dying a day. Uh, you know, We're out of a terrible, terrible time that we were in, but it's certainly not over. And when 2000 people are dying a day, you should take notice of that. And um, if there's a vaccine that's 100% effective at preventing that, um, that any kind of mythical or um, theoretical problem that you may perceive of the vaccine really outweighs that. Like everything we do in medicine is a, a scale, right? We think about what are the benefits I can get from this and what are the risks I'm taking? So if 2000 people are dying a day and maybe there's some kind of theoretical risk, I mean, that says to me the scales are way tipped in the vaccine uh, side. Remember that, that the decisions about vaccination should be made based upon facts, not based upon beliefs. Yeah, and I also have been getting all those questions, Dr. Lashley, and um, even if you're pregnant, even if you're breastfeeding, um, and absolutely, if you wanna have children later in life because you really have to be alive for that. Um, and you also have to be able to meet people and go about, you know, a normal um, existence to some degree. And, and it's only going to be the vaccine that's going to get us there. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you to our panelists. I really enjoyed um, hearing all of you and, and the dialogue back and forth. We are going to send this out to everybody with the questions, with whatever supplements we have. And you know, if you are an allied family, your pediatrician is able to help you with a lot of the basic things that we spoke about today. Um, if you have any issues, um, Dr. Lashley, myself, Dr. Parles, you can certainly reach out to us and we will find somebody within um, allied who can make that happen for you. And I wish everybody well and a happy holiday season. And hopefully we are looking at, um, at better times. At least we're looking at better weather, which definitely makes things a lot easier. So thank you everybody. And um, Dr. And Paul, do you wanna say something? You know, I just wanna say thank you for another great job of moderating. You, you, you are um, consistently excellent at this and, and you enhance the experience for everybody. So. So uh, I wanted to say that because I don't think I've said that before. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye everyone. Take care. Thank you.